All right. So we'll just start off with, uh, if you could state your name. Sure. My name is Phil Hero. And when were you born? Ninth, September 13th, 1947. And where are you living now? I live in Lowell. And where where were you born? I was born in, actually I was born in Everett, but I grew up in Malden, in Tewksbury. So Massachusetts. Yes, yeah, yeah. And uh, what is your marital status? I am married, have been for 44 years. Oh. Do you have any children? We have, I have one son. One son. And any grandchildren? Two grandchildren, yeah. And your hometown, you said was? Right now it's Lowell. And your initial, like, where, where did you grow up, I guess? Until um, I was 14, I lived in Malden, and then after when I was 14, I moved to Tewksbury. Okay. And uh, what kind of things did your parents do for a living? Well, my father worked at General Electric, and my mother worked for the old phone company. And do you have brothers, sisters? I have one brother and one sister. Were you close with, like, uh, cousins or...? It was a big family, so... Um, I have a lot of cousins. Yep. Yeah. And uh, could you speak a little bit about like uh, what your life in your hometown was like? Well, growing up in Malden, I, we lived across the street from my grandparents. Uh, my father was one of eleven. We lived in a duplex with my uncle downstairs and my father upstairs. My grandmother and grandfather, a couple of the aunts, right across the street. Um, <coughs> it was again the the. the 1950s, um, went to school, was uh, an active member of the little church. I was an altar boy for a lot of years. Um, it was, I, I think, just a normal child that went to school and did the things you needed to do. Kind of, would you say, like a small town life? Or? Malden wasn't really that small, but um, I, I just, uh, it, was, it wasn't a big city, yep. and it wasn't the country. Yep. So fairly community based though. You said you were involved in the church. Yeah, yeah. The, my my grandfather and that father were spent a lot of time at the church. Yeah. So. So did you go to a Catholic school or nope, public no, school? Went to um, the Linden Elementary School and Brown Junior High School before we moved to Tuxbury. Yep. And uh, then Tuxbury High. Or? Yes. Yep. yep. And um, anything stand out in high school experience in Tuxbury or? Uh, again, not really. We'd. The family had had a summer home in Tewksbury for years, so I, I, it wasn't um, really traumatic for me to move up You're there. Familiar I, with I, the I knew area. everybody and I, uh, that, yeah. that I went to school with. Um, no, just uh, again, it was high school, did what I had to do, and graduated. And We've all been there. Moved on, yeah. yeah. <laughs> did you have a favorite subject? Um, I used to like ancient history and, and, um, and uh, believe it or not, Latin. No, I it, took some Latin. Latin yeah. fun. Yeah. Uh, were you involved in any clubs, sports, any activities at school? The first year I was there, I went out for football, but I didn't, I didn't yeah. like that. I, I get the bottom, was at the bottom of too many pig piles, so, <laughs> so that was enough of that. You know, it, it was mostly um, just uh, my friends and I would go skating and we'd play hockey in the river and that type of thing. Yeah, so no big clubs. More recreational stuff. Yeah. Yep. Um, now we've got some questions more about that. Uh, the economy and sure. things like that. So things like uh, candy, soda, ice cream, snacks. You remember how much things like that cost? I remember it wasn't much. Yeah. Uh, I think you know the the old dear idea of penny candy. You could get penny candy. You could get a nickel f uh, for a, for a, a coke. Um, the movies were were not expensive e either. You know, five uh, ten cents to a quarter to go to the movies was wasn't much. Yeah. So if like your friends wanted to go hang out and grab a soda or something after school, it wasn't wasn't really like oh not today guys I can't. Uh... Well, again, depending on um, what was going on in people's lives, I mean, yeah. Sometimes you had extra money, sometimes you didn't. Sure. Um, so you usually we could, but I I had um, jobs from the time I was like like twelve and thirteen, so mm -hmm. I always had some kind of spending money early on. <coughs> excuse me, not as much because my. You know, my my father at one time had hurt his back, so he was out of work for about two years. Things that, were that, that was difficult. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so, so, what did you do for money? What kind of jobs were you doing? Um, usually helping the people in the neighborhood, you know, cutting grass, um, doing yard work um, in the in the winter time. A lot of snow shoveling. Yep. And then when I moved to Tewksbury, I got a real job in a bakery. But in Malden, it was everywhere. Everything was so close. You would just go from one neighbor to the next, just doing odd jobs and chores for them. 
And the bakery was it like a small family owned bakery. Yeah, yeah. yeah, it was. Yeah. Uh, movies you mentioned. Did you go to the movies often? Um, probably once or twice a month. Um, I had, I had my, one of my cousins lived downstairs, and she would always take me and my sister to the movies. Yeah. And more like everyday things, like radio, television. Was that a a big pastime, or was that more? Um, not early on, but as as probably by the middle middle fifties, it, it, television became important mm-hmm. to us. Prior to that, I don't think we we, we got a television until. 1955 or so, um, but then after that, you know, you'd watch it, you'd, you'd watch the, you know, the comedies and some of the sports shows. Yeah. Yeah. And what was it like, a like an event? Like, did the family all get together, sit around for the evening news, or? Um, sometimes, yeah. you know, it, it depended. With my father, often worked many different shifts, um, but at night after dinner, we, we would we'd all hang out, settle in. Yeah. Yeah. Did you have a, a favorite show or a favorite type of show? Roll Howdy Doody, <laughs> and there was a science fiction show, um, something in the Lost Riders, I think it was. It was based in the West, and these cowboys were always chasing, um, chasing and being chased by aliens who had a base within them in a mountain. It was a, I forget the name of it, Gene Autry and the Lost Riders, something. But it was a great show. Interesting. Yeah, I have to really look cool into that. Show. Yeah. Um, do you have any uh, favorite games? or toys, um, you know, what kind of things did you do maybe in the neighborhood after school? Or well, again, we used to play, we was Sandlot Baseball, we'd, yep. we'd all get together and um, there was a field, we'd burn it down in the spring so we, we could play ball <laughs> on it. Um, but it was, it was, nothing was organized, it was all just, you know, us neighborhood kids. Neighborhood kids. Yeah. And uh, were you walking to each other's houses, yeah, taking yeah. bikes? Yeah, yeah. Yep. walking around. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we did some of that stuff, part-time jobs. Uh, did you uh, have your own car at all growing up? Or Once I moved to Tuxpin, I was old enough. When I was 16, 17, 16 or 17, I got my first car. Was that something you saved up for yourself? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it didn't cost me that much. It cost me $49. Wow. On the, on the very beginning. <laughs> it was an old Ford, 54 Ford station wagon. And it was cool because under the... Under the, the, on the driver's side, it was all rotted out. So you just have to put a piece of plywood down so the right down to the road would <laughs> come splashing up. But yeah, it was, I saved up for it, but yeah. it was, wasn't much. Now, did you get it for a deal? Did you get it off a friend or family member? Uh, or did you buy it at a, a dealership? Guy, no, a guy I knew was wanted to get rid of it. He'd driven it for a long time and he needed 50 bucks, so I had 49. There you go, you'll That's take it. it yeah. <laughs> um, all right, so where are we? So, now you obviously were in the military. Yes. And uh, what branch were you in? I was in the Army. The Army? Yeah. And you said you chose to enlist? I enlisted, And this yes, was yeah. uh, during Vietnam, Yes, right? yeah. So, uh, could you talk about um, maybe what year you enlisted and maybe some of the, uh, the I enlist, reasons I you enlisted chose I enlisted in 1968. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Late, uh, early 1968. Did my basic training down at Fort Dix. I come up to... Fort Bragg for my advanced training. I was in the Army Security Agency, um, and we were it was crypto 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 analysis work that we did. Um, so I we spent four four or five months at Fort Dix, uh, Fort Devens, um, and was it then went to from Fort Devens went to Two Rock Ranch in Petaluma, California for, adva- for in fur- further advanced training. Specialized. And, yeah, and then we went to Vietnam for I was there for a little over a year. So you're doing more uh, like technical duties, more. Um, yeah, we we everybody's trained for combat, but we weren't right. combat troops. We were, right. um, well, again, crypt analysts. We were, we were the the code breakers. Mm-hmm. We worked as the precursor of the National Security Agency. So we did a lot of that kind of stuff. Um, so, how long were you stationed in? Uh, I was in Vietnam for just about a year. Just about a year. And where were you? In Pleiku, Pleiku, which is in the Central Islands. And was that uh, like a, an area of high conflict or more? Um, we got there um, the year after Tet, the Tet Offensive, the 68 Tet Offensive. So there was some things going on, but not, not, not a lot near us. We could probe a couple of times, but it was not It was very little combat. So you weren't involved in any major battles? Oh, no. no. Again, we were probed a few times in here. Right. You know, from the, the bunkers, we were, you know, did what we had to do, but I wasn't on a patrol doing those type of things. 
So you, you were uh, under fire a few times? Yeah. Like, yeah. Uh, do you want to speak to anything about, you know, the experience? It, you know? It, it didn't last that long, so that was a good thing. Yeah. Um, and it, it's, it's kind of terrifying. It, yeah. When somebody's shooting at you, you can't see it. Um, but again, we, where we were, we were in, in a, a compound. And out in front of us, there was all barbed wire and a minefield and all of that. And then there was a Vietnamese um, training camp uh, to the further down to the right in the valley. Behind us, there was, I think, one of the engineer divisions and, and an artillery division. So we were fairly well protected. It was a well secured area. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, we, we, were, we were probed, like I say, a few times, mortared a few times. But Did you have any involvement with the, uh, the Vietnamese training camp that you mentioned? Was um, Every now and then some Vietnamese officers would come over and, they, and we'd have to give them a briefing on what, you know, what we were doing. Yeah. But our stuff was, was really highly classified. Okay. Um, and so when they would come into the compound, we'd have to cover up the maps so they couldn't see certain things yeah. where some of our people were. So, yeah. so, so we, we, some, but not, not a lot. Most of the contact was with you know, the local um, military intelligence people in Saigon on, on the train. Not to train uh, Cameron, or back in the states. So were you uh, like going out and like gathering intel, or were you doing more analytical things? More back analytical. In the a couple times we, I w I'd go. I went to up to Fubai one time. I went to um, not not Kesa, but I went to Fubai, and there was a couple of in in, in country places I went to to um, work with the folks there. A couple times I went out with the Air Force. They'd go up and. And their planes, and they would take the RDF shots to find out where the people were. So we, we, I did that a few times, um, but it, mostly it was we worked out of uh, Pleiku. And um, well, this is kind of what was the weather like? Um, two seasons: the wet season and the dry season. Um, in the wet season, it rained. Yep. In the dry season, um, I think I still have some clothes that are. are inundated with this red dust <laughs> from from um, the, the, the the ground in the area so hot it was hot um, and it was wet yep. yeah but um, your clothing and equipment do you feel like you were uh, you know well protected oh, well yeah. provided for yeah, yeah. so there wasn't really times where you uh, you were uncomfortable or like cold or well, just that during the rainy season yeah I mean, it was sloshing around in the mud going from the barracks over to the uh, the, the secure compound but no we, we were they provided for us pretty well. Um, did you have any contact with the people at home, writing, receiving letters? Oh yeah, things yeah of that there nature? was always the, the writing back and forth. Um, on my way from Boston to California, I had met a, a four cousins that I had never met before. So I, I, you know, it was nice. We got a nice relationship going with them, and we corresponded back quite a bit while I was over there. And we still do today. So and that was it was a nice um, meeting, so to speak. Of, Meeting these folks, that um, it was my mother's older brother who moves out, moved out to California at the end of the First World War. He's there for, I think, three years, and he gets killed in a car accident. So nobody, nobody had been with these cousins out for a long touch time. Them, yeah, sure. so, no, but it was nice. It was nice to meet them. And that was all by happenstance. Yes. Um, no, I knew I was going out there. And so you, you went and saw them. I, I looked them up. Yeah. Oh. yeah. Nice. Yeah. Uh, so you never felt like, did you feel like out of touch with home at, or um, did you feel you had enough communication that you were still up to date on what was going on with everyone? Um, yeah, pretty much. Um, Viet Vietnam wasn't, you weren't compl completely incommunicado like you were in different, at, at other times. Mm -hmm. um, you had the newspaper, you had radio, I mean Radio Saigon had all kinds of broadcasts and all kinds of information, so you had a good sense of what was going on. Um, the night of the moon landing. We were in the compound, um, and we were sitting there just, just listening to the folks um, getting out, and that one small step for man and one giant step for, for mankind. We're all sitting there just mesmerized to listen to listening to the radio when that was going on. So, um, yeah, no, we, we were in touch, and, and we were in, te in intelligence anyway, so we had a, a, good, a good sense of what was going on everywhere. So, right. Yeah. Um, so obviously, yeah, that speaks to uh, how you stayed informed about the war. Were you aware of like what was going on in other regions? Or? Yeah, because we were the main region we had was was the Pleiku region, <clears throat> but they were being um, the Asha Valley was over to the to the east of us, um, northeast of us, 
northeast, out to the east of us. No, the, I'm sorry, the west of us. And so we knew what was going on as people were going through. Um, and some of the other uh, intelligence posts, we had contact with them as well. So we had a pretty good sense. Not so much in the, in the south below Saigon, but in the central highlands up to the DMZ, we did. We, we yep. did. Certainly being an intelligence, that's yeah. part of your job. Yeah, for, it is, yeah. yeah. Well, um, <clears throat> like, you mentioned the radio broadcast where, yeah. where things uh, being reported in the radio broadcast as far as news. That, sure. Like, yeah. 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 Um, did you have a chance to have uh, fun while off duty, uh, on base or off yeah, base? Yeah, there was an NCO club that we spent a lot of time at the NCO club. Um, and it's just a bar room, just a beer hall. <laughs> so we spent a lot of time there. And every now and then they'd, they'd send in one of those USO troops. Uh, they'd bring in the, the, the Hollywood starlets or the musicians or something. But most of us were too cool to go to that. Yeah. We, we didn't like that. So. Um, and then you could go to downtown Pleiku, which was just a, a, a little village that you could go in and there were little bar rooms down there and stuff. But um, during, during your tour of duty, you get a week, what they call R&R. &R, and I went to Thailand for R&R, &R, which was a lot of fun. You get to see a, a really beautiful country. Yeah. Did you go with uh, guys from your unit? Um, I No, I went by myself. Yep. Um, I was on a plane with you know several hundred other people. Sure. But, uh, but I, I just went by myself. Well, you're over there. You get yeah. a chance to explore the yep. world. Yeah. Yep. Nice. Yep. Um, as far as uh, on base, off duty stuff, was mm -hmm. it like, were you working like, you know, nine to five? Was it, did it feel like an no, office you, job or was it? You worked, to, it, it would depend. It, you, you'd work. I think we had 10 hour shifts. Mm -hmm. um, but in, in the communications field, um, the people that you're tracking every now and then, they would change their, their way of doing things. They mm -hmm. would change their call signs. So you'd have to go out and recreate um, who they were, where they were. Or what they were doing, and that happened. That happened probably four or five times. So when that happens, you're, you're literally working around the clock to 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 Get back on to, track. to re-identify who they are yeah. and what they're doing. Yeah. Did you have like a, a personal radio, or was it? Um... Yeah, I had, yeah, we had a personal radio. And you spoke about the uh, the USO visits. <coughs> uh, those weren't a big hit with the guys. No. No. Well, to some people. <laughs> Yeah. Some of us were just too cool for that <laughs> because we had to go. They, they, they forced us to go, so oh. we'd always find ways to get yeah, to go. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, were you awarded any medals or commendations for your I service? got an Army Commendation Medal for um, during one of these, what they, what they call comm changes, the communication changes. We working with this other, this other fellow, we solved it in about four hours, so that was, that was pretty good. Yeah. yeah. Now, uh, how long do you think typically, you know, stuff like that would, would take you to do? It, it really depends on the intensity yeah. of it. Some, some used to take, you know, weeks. Mm -hmm. yeah. Some would take days. Um, and then, um, depending on, on the severity of it, it could, it could be, you know, fairly quickly. This, this, was, a, this was a major one. Uh, but we got it done in about six hours, so that was, that was important. And it was, again, you're, you're not doing it entirely by yourself. You really are working with Yep. It was my job to analyze this stuff, but there was you worked with a fellow who was um, who actually listened to the code and we could identify the code. And he would say, "Hey, gee, I think the way this guy is sending the code, I think that's so and so from you know the, this division or that battalion." And by once you get that one link, you can you can trace the others. So. And the these codes you were getting, they were like radio transmissions. Yeah, or yeah, yeah. The old, the Morse code. Yep, Morse yeah, code. Yeah. So none of it was like. Uh, written codexes you had to figure out. It was um, sometimes we would get that from the folks that were in the field. Yeah, harder intercept, intercept yeah, that kind yeah, of stuff. Yeah, but this this was mainly um, just the, 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 the Morse code that they used to send. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, and when were you discharged? I got out in, in um, December of 71. And where were you discharged? So? Well, at the time I was stationed at Fort Bragg in North Carolina. Yeah. So they, they get discharged from there. So you did uh, one year over mm -hmm. in Vietnam, and yep. you uh, served the rest of your duty stateside. Yes. Yep. Okay. And were you doing similar work when you were stateside? Or? States. Well, I, when I get back, I wanted to go to Germany, but they they, they, they had people over there. They didn't need me, so yep. they wanted me to go to to Fort Bragg uh, to work with some of the newer folks that were coming in. Mm -hmm. So I, I was there as a training NCO for um, for what, almost two years. 
Okay. Sort through some of these things here. Uh, now, coming home, I know you've told a few stories about yeah. this. Yeah. Uh, could you just maybe talk a little bit about, um, you know, uh, how you were advised? To... Yeah, it was when I got out in '71. It was really the, the anti-war movement was really going pretty pretty strong. Um, when I landed in San Francisco, before I even left Vietnam, they suggested if if um, we land in San Francisco and you're going to transfer to go someplace else. Put on your civilian clothes. Don't travel in uniform. Again, because there were a lot of protesters right. out there at the time. So um, so we did. I mean, I just didn't just wear my uniform. Just put on you know, civilian clothes. And Try to when I get back to job. Boston, you know, it was fine. My girlfriend picked me up and, yeah. and um, my parents. But then I, then I went back to school. So um, I just kept a low profile low profile because there was a lot of um, angst and anger about yeah. the war and I just didn't want to get involved in it. I'd been there for a year and then my four years in the military and I didn't need, didn't want that crap from anybody so I just... So you yourself never experienced any, uh, you know, uh, violent protest or, you know? Um, when I was at Fort Bragg, <coughs> excuse me, Jane Fonda and her group came, came through um, and I went out to take a look at her because I wanted to see what she looked like. <laughs> so there was you know, there was a little bit of it then, but yeah. um, directed at me personally, no. no. We were in, in, in mass. We were called you know baby killers and that type of thing. Right. But um, individually directed at me, no. Uh, do you know anyone who maybe had a different experience? Oh yeah, there, there was people that um, I, that lived in in uh, California. A couple of folks from New York. Mm -hmm. That I haven't talked to them in years, but they were telling me that there were different protests that um, they happened to be there when the stuff was going on. Yeah. And, um, it was it was directed at them, and, and they felt they felt threatened. So yeah. yeah. Um, is there any any final thoughts? Any more anything else you'd like to get out? You know, this is about getting your story yeah. out there. No, I mean I I I came from a family that had participated in, in all the previous wars from the First World War on. Um, it, we felt it was our duty to support our country, and mm -hmm. uh, you went and you did it. Yep. So you enlisted, you did your job, and then you come home. So, yeah. And um, so uh, would you say you uh, supported the war then, or did you more support the, the administration and In your country? Initially, again, it was doing my duty to, to, to the country. As Once I get back and, and you see more and more of what it was doing to this country, then you then you have a, a different outlook of it. Sure. Um, you never support war. Um, <coughs> I didn't support the, the, the war itself. I, I supported doing my, my what I felt was my duty. Family to, to, tradition to and yeah. obligation to the country. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. And yeah. then obviously, you know, as time goes on, things change yeah. more. And you more look back and say, what the hell were we doing? Yeah. 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 Uh, unless that's, unless you have anything else you'd like to say. No, I don't. That's all right. Well, sorry. Thank you very much for uh, doing the interview, and thank you very much for your service.